Hello, Potato! Once again, we find ourselves at the fireside, which can mean only one thing. I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, today's story, I don't believe, has any adult language in it, but does deal with adult content. So, you know, not for the kids. It's not written for the kids. Frankly, nothing on this channel is really for the kids. It's just a lot of it's not inappropriate for the kids. Which, you know, you have to keep convincing YouTube of that occasionally by throwing out an F-bomb. Which I... No, I did. One story did have an F-bomb, I think, in it. Anyways, enough of that. That's not what you're here for. Hopefully, what you're here for is to hear a story. So please, come join me by the fireside. And I will commence story time. The Cabin in Winter The cold wind wakes me like a slap in the face. My eyes jerk open and all I see is white. I think I've gone blind at first until I realize I'm in the middle of a snowy field. I look down at myself to confirm that I can see, but all my eyes are greeted with is a white winter coat. I do have black gloves on, and they stand out in contrast against the whiteness of everything else. I take in my surroundings, trying to remember where I am, how I got here, trying to remember who I am. I'm sitting on a bench at the edge of a field like someone waiting at a bus stop. There are dense trees surrounding the clearing. In the very center of the open space is a cabin with a trail of smoke rising from the metal pipe on its roof. Something about that cabin makes me uneasy, but I don't know why. I look around for any signs of how I got here. There are no tracks in the snow, foot, tire, nothing. But it's also snowing, so if I've been here for any length of time, they may have been covered up. I don't think there's a road here, though. The barrier of trees doesn't have any openings where a road could run through. There's a dark blue backpack on the bench next to me. I wonder if it'll tell me who or where I am. I brush away the layers of snow that have landed on top of the bag and unzip the top. Inside the bag are three hardback books. Pandemic by Scott Sigler, The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt by Edmund Morris, and Pressure Cooker Perfection by America's Test Kitchen. What the hell am I doing with a cookbook? Digging past the books, I find a package of white socks, a box of salt, a jar of garlic powder, and a manila envelope. I pull out the envelope and open it. Inside, there is a single thick piece of paper and a disc, although I don't know if it's a CD or a DVD. The piece of paper has a man's picture on it. I think it's me. I put the items back in the envelope and the envelope back in the bag. I dig around some more to find what looks like a sharpening stone, a container of antacids, and a box of matches. This doesn't make any sense. If I were going someplace snowy, why would I pack this assortment of crap? Maybe I'm stupid. I zip the backpack back up, sling it onto my shoulder, and get up from the bench. My feet crunch in the snow, leaving deep footprints behind me as I head for the tree line. The trees are tight together, but there should be plenty enough space between them for a person to fit through. I make my way to the tree line to stop. I've hit something. I put my hands out towards the trees, but something is keeping me from touching them. It feels like I'm touching a glass wall. I take the glove off of my right hand and touch the wall. I feel... nothing. It's not cold like glass would be, but it's not warm either. It doesn't feel like anything, but I cannot put my hand through it. I try pounding my fist against the barrier. It doesn't hurt, and it doesn't make any sort of noise. I don't understand this. The snow seems to be passing through it, and when I blow on it, the vapor from my breath passes through easily enough, but I can't. I swing the backpack against it, and it bounces back like it hits something. I... I don't know how to put this into words. It's like I'm pushing against a solid wall while pushing against nothing. I can feel the presence of the barrier, but I can't feel the surface of it. There's a hard, solid object there while being nothing but open space. There must be a gap, or a break in it. I got in here somehow, right? If I can get in, then I can get out. I start moving to my left, sliding my hand over the smooth yet non-existent surface that is keeping me from getting through to the trees. I slog through the snow around the edge of the open space, my hand always inches from the trees, but never able to quite touch them. There aren't any breaks. How can there not be a way through? I've gone far enough around the clearing now to see the front of the cabin, and I still haven't found a way through. You may as well give up, son! A voice comes to me on the wind. I turn from my invisible wall to see an old man sitting on the cabin's porch. He's wearing a red and black coat, a furry cap, and a smoking a pipe. He doesn't look dangerous, but something in him makes me cringe all the same. You can't get out, he calls to me. Not like that, anyhow. I swallow down my fear and call to the old man. Where am I? What? The old man yells back. Where am I? How did I get here? You're going to have to come closer, son. My hearing's not what it was. 
He seems harmless enough. Old, certainly. I dismiss my unease as just a reaction to the situation. It seems like he might have some answers, anyway. I trudge across the snow and step up onto the cabin's porch. The boards creak under my weight. I can see the old man better now, and he looks even older than I first thought. Eighty, at least. He's sitting in an old rocking chair. There's a table next to him with a metal ashtray and a hardback book. The dust cover has been removed, so I cannot see the title. You've been checking that wall for a while now? The old man asks. I was tempted to let you go all the way around if you didn't look over at me yourself, but I was thinking on going inside, and I didn't want to leave you out here. Um, thanks, I say, running my hands through my hair to brush out the loose snow. I once saw this girl go all the way around twice before she finally come talk to me. I find that as I grow older, I lack patience to let you kids do that, though. The old man shakily rises from the chair. It's head inside. It's nice and warm in there. The old man walks past me and opens the cabin door, a plain brown thing with four small windows set into it that creaks loudly as he forces the hinges to move. He enters the cabin and leaves the door open behind him. Hurry up, before you let all the cold in, he says as he strips off his coat. The door takes a bit of effort to get closed, but it seals the cold out nicely. The inside of the cabin is quite warm thanks to the big stove near the center of it, and the heat makes my cheeks and ear burn from being in the cold outside. There's a large steaming pot on top of the stove. Get out of that wet coat before you drip it all over my floor, the old man orders. You can hang it on the hooks there. There are four hooks on the wall next to the door. The old man's coat is on one, and a blue coat of a similar style to my own is next to it. I hang my coat on one of the empty hooks, drop my backpack on the floor under it, and look around. The walls of the house are hidden behind bookshelves that run all the way around the front room, only broken by the windows and doors. There's an easy chair and a shabby sofa facing the stove on one side, and a small round table with three chairs on the other. At the back of the room are a pair of doors. I imagine that one is to the bathroom and the other is to the man's bedroom, but I don't know. Next to the doors is a sink, some cabinets, and a fridge that looks like it was old when the old man was young. Where am I? I ask. Get right to the point, don't you? The man says, stirring the steaming pot with a long-handled spoon. You haven't even introduced yourself yet, boy. I'm sorry, but I don't know who I am. Old man laughs like it's the funniest thing he's ever heard. No, of course you don't. No one who comes here does. He puts the spoon down on a plate on the small table and walks over to me. He leans close to my ear. Tell you the truth. I don't know who I am either. And he cackles again. Do you know where here is? I ask. I call it the snow globe. Snow's here all the time, the man says. Been here a long time, I think. I bet you're hungry. There's a little stew left in there if you want some. There's bowls by the sink. I realize that I am hungry. I see a dish strainer next to the sink and a pair of brown bowls and some utensils sitting in it. I take a bowl and a spoon and go over to the stew pot. Thank you, I say to the old man as I spoon out some of the meat and broth into a bowl. I'm happy to share, the old man says. Take a seat and enjoy. I sit at the table and begin to eat. The meat is kind of grayish, but it smells like beef. I wonder if I get food poisoning from eating meat that's gone off or something. I take a bite and it tastes a little sweet. Pork, maybe. Finally, the old man exclaims. I've been waiting to read this. The first two were great. I turn and see that the old man is going through my backpack. He's looking at one of the books. It looks like the pandemic one. Excuse me, I say once I've swallowed. Ah, salt! Thank God, he says like I hadn't spoken. And some new socks! Excuse me, sir, I say rising from the table. That's my bag. That's everything I have, I think. The old man looks at me. I'm sorry. It's just been a while and I've been running out of some stuff. Like I said, that's the last of the stew there. Some vegetables would have been nice, though. Not like I can grow anything on my own out here. So there are other people here? I ask, looking at the blue coat hung next to mine. Nope, just you and me right now. I'm sure you'll be passing on soon, though. The old man pulls out the manila envelope. Here we go. Let's find out who you are. The old man crosses the room and stoops down to open a cabinet at the bottom of one of the bookshelves. He pulls out a laptop computer and comes over to place it on the kitchen table. I wouldn't keep this in there, you know. That's where the plug socket is. What sort of idiot puts a plug socket in a cabinet? he asks, as he opens the computer's lid. While the computer boots up, the old man slips a photo and disc out of the envelope. Handsome, aren't you? he asks, holding the picture up. I bet you pulled the ladies, didn't you? Or did you prefer guys? I don't know. Don't worry about it. I ain't here to judge you. Now let's see who you were. I don't like the way you phrase that. The old man puts the disc into the computer and uses the computer's touchpad to access it. Okay, so you were Anders Anderson, he laughs at my name. 
No wonder you ended up here with a name like that. I bet you got mocked something fierce in school. That disc says who I am? Yep. Ah, I wish they had these things and they put me in here. At least then I'd know why I'm here. Why am I here? Let's see. He reads the screen. It seems you are a... He pauses for effect. Murderer. Shot up a shopping mall. No, I say. The idea repulses me. Yep, that's pretty normal here. Look for yourself. He turns the screen towards me and leaves the table. Murder's what gets most people sent here. Rape occasionally. Makes me wonder what kind of a bastard I was. How many people have been put here, I ask. God, must be a few hundred by now. I got albums full of your pictures. I expect they'll be sending a new album soon. Hope to send some vegetables, too. I can't look away from the computer. There's a mugshot of the man in the photo, of me, and a mass of text describing how I killed 28 civilians and two police officers before I was captured. So, if there have been hundreds of people like me, where are they now? They passed on, the old man replies. I can see him out of the corner of my eye. He's standing by the sink. He'll be passing on shortly, and in a week or two, they'll send me someone else. You said that before, I say. Passing on. Where will I pass on to? You see, I figure I must have done something really awful, he continues without replying to me. Because they want me to suffer. They want me to survive. That's why they keep sending folks like you to me. You kids pass on while I remain. Pass on to where, I say, still looking at the computer. There are links in the document, and clicking on them opens pictures of dead, bloody bodies. One of the pictures is a child clutching a blood-stained, stuffed rabbit. Half of the child's head is missing. If I were a stronger man, a better man, I would just let myself go. The old man starts towards me. I tried, but it's so hard. One of these days I'll go through, and then one of you kids will take over for me. Until then, well... I just get so hungry. Hungry? I turn in time to see the old man coming at me, the cleaver in his right hand raised above his head, ready to split mine. He moves fast. Very, very fast. And that was The Cabin in Winter. So, information on this story, um, obviously it's another clever fiction story. Every story I've done so far in Storytime has been a clever fiction story. This one is no different. Um, this one actually started out as a different story, though. Originally, this was going to be called The House at the Edge of the Sea. It would have been essentially the same exact story, but set on a beach. And Clever Fiction released their prompt for that week, which was a picture of a bench in like a snowy field, like a snowy setting. There's like snow in the background. And that just worked for me. I mean, that's, I don't know if the House at the Edge of the Sea would have been any different, but I don't think so, and I really do like the snow globe idea, because it gives a nice reason for why they're in there. Sometimes I kind of wonder what led to this happening, and sometimes I kind of wonder if I shouldn't try to explore that and maybe write a story that explains how we got to where the story is, and then I think, well, I might just ruin it. You know? Prequels, not always a great idea. Well, that's going to do it for today. Thank you for joining me by the fireside. I hope you enjoyed this tale. If you did, please give it a like. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to my channel to see other story times, as well as the other ridiculous, horrible things I eat and open, and time that I waste making videos for you to waste your time with. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Void of Intelligence, and don't forget that I will see you in the next video.